welcome to this panel discussion on sustainable sport. My name is Samantha Connolly and I'll be the facilitator for this session. I'm a senior sustainability consultant with CH2M Hill. And for the past four years, I've been working as a sustainability assurance manager on the London 2012 Games. And I'm currently based in Rio, working on the Rio 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Today we have um, two other members within our panel discussion. And I would just like to invite first off Ingrid to introduce herself. Thank you very much. So my name is Ingrid de Beutler and I'm the director of the Social Responsibility Unit at Sport Accord. And Sport Accord is the umbrella organization for all international sports federations. So we have 107 members, 91 international sports going from FIFA as our largest, both Olympic and non-Olympic sports. And we have a number of associate members, including the Paralympic Games, Deaf Olympics, Special Olympics, etc. So I'm responsible for all the matters related to sustainability amongst those our members as we try to move forward the sustainability agenda amongst international sports federations. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ingrid. And David, if I could hand over to you to introduce yourself, please. Sure. Uh, my name's David McRae. I'm a vice president of a company called MV Global Transport Logistics, and we're a, a service provider to the major event industry in the functional area of transport. Um, so I'll, I'll contribute uh, from that side of things, which obviously transport and sustainability are, are, are a, a big uh, contributor to the debate. But as well as that, I'm a former Paralympic athlete and uh, competed in the Paralympic Games for 20 years and was chairman of the IPC Athletes Commission uh, around about the same time as the IOC Athletes Commission and IPC Athletes Commission uh, started to collaborate and come together to work together. So I'll, I'll hope to contribute as a former Paralympian but someone as a service provider in the industry as well. Okay, thank you very much David. So we're going to kick off this session by um, asking, the, posing the first question for our panel, and that is, what does sustainable sport mean to you? So Ingrid, if I could ask you to um, respond to the first question, please. Certainly. So if it's always going to be me as first. Um, not a no, problem. No. <laughs> so this is good. I think for, for us, from the position of, uh, as, a, as an umbrella organisation, Sustainable sport, we will know that we've, we've achieved sustainability in sport when we have it fully integrated as an integral part of the events of all of our members. Currently, it's predominantly the larger sports events, such as the Olympics, such as the FIFA World Cup, who have it either as part of the bid process or very, very early on, it's taken in as a, as a, as a very important part of the, of the event. Yet we've only got amongst of our 107 members, we have probably about 25 of them who really consider sustainability seriously. Obviously the social dimension, if, if we think of sustainability, the three pillars of it, the social dimension is, we can say, a lot more advanced than the environmental dimension. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of grassroots sports initiatives that are linked to our members. Um, and what we're trying to do is very much uh, to coordinate between those grassroots social initiatives with the international sports events themselves. At the environmental dimension, there's a lot of education still to be done. So for us, I think what, we, what sustainable sport means to us is very much that it becomes part and parcel of all sports events, going from the biggies, um, those that are run by the International Sports Federations, the big multi-sports events such as the Paralympic Games, such as the Special Olympics, um, down to the smaller local clubs events. That it's no longer, we don't have discussions like this, it's just part and parcel of how the events are organised. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much Ingrid. David, if you'd like to contribute to the question of what does sustainable sport mean to you? Well, yeah, as, a, as I said earlier, as a former Paralympian and someone who competed in the days when the Paralympic Games were, the crowds were, let's say, let's say small in number. I, I made a comparison recently to 
the London 2012 Paralympic Games where uh, the, the stadium was a sellout of up to almost 80,000 people. Uh, in my first Paralympic Games in 1980, when I competed, um, I could virtually pick out my mum and dad in the crowd, no problem, because the numbers were so small um, as a 17-year-old uh, competitor. So for me, as, as someone who's witnessed it from literally uh, mum and dad in the stands to 80,000 people, Sustaining that momentum for a movement like the International Paralympic Committee that has worked hard to take take it from a, a, a disability-based movement to a predominantly sports and excellence in sports and performance movement, that sustainability, that, sorry, to be able to sustain that in Sochi and in Rio and, and wherever we'll end up in uh, in 2020 in Pyeongchang in 2018 is is maintaining that momentum for an organization like the IPC is hyper important so to be able to do that you really have to take in my view the lessons from London that said what made that what made that appeal what made it what turned it into a real true high performance sport that that meant we had something like 14 hours live coverage on television in the United Kingdom for the Paralympics. Unprecedented, never heard of before. Um, and, and in 1980 in the UK, there was one one-hour program uh, about two months after the event. So to try to take that on to Rio, to try to really uh, uh, take that forward and, and, and not just sustain the International Paralympic Committee and, and sport for disabled people as a movement is a is really that's where the key questions are for me as a former athlete wanting to see it grow even more and take that 14 hours of live coverage and take it to a country like the United States for example where that attraction within DC sports isn't quite there yet just like it was with Channel 4 in the UK. Okay thank you thanks thanks David. Um, and I would just also like to add um, my thoughts on what sustainable sport means to me and I suppose as my background in the construction industry, it's really about the development and the infrastructure that goes into hosting major events and how um, Ingrid talked about the social side but when you're constructing new venues it's really um, understanding the environmental impacts of, of the new development of the infrastructure of the venues and how you can really try to embrace um, sustainable construction techniques. Um, so it's, uh, I think we did it quite well in London and as David was saying we're hoping to take these lessons forward into Rio and, and future um, sporting, major sporting events um, and hopefully the smaller sporting events as well about really how the, um, sustainable sports and the construction industry and the development industry really has an opportunity to um, create uh, and, and, and develop sustainable construction techniques. Could I just add one more thing and just sure. to take it not and to focus a little bit off the Paralympic side of things, if we look at the Olympic side of things as well as far as sports like wrestling for example which has had some some PR where it's not out of the program but uh, in the Olympic uh, program but has to reapply to join the program again, take a sport like that who, who in numbers wise really needs to uh, fight, fight hard to stay in the Paralympic, uh, sorry, in the Olympic program, but also if it comes out, it, it has a serious PR difficulty in maintaining its participation levels across the world. And, and we, we see in, in softball and baseball how hard those sports are fighting to get back into the movement. So I think. Uh, there, there's some issues there in the Olympic world, not just as I have related to originally in the Paralympic world, about sustaining the volume of people that take part in, in our sports and in physical activity throughout the world. Okay, thank you, David. And I think maybe we'll touch on that in our next question, which, which I'll move on to now, um, which is what are the top challenges in making a sporting event more sustainable? And I'll open this to either one of you, Ingrid or David, to, um, to give us your thoughts thoughts on what the top challenges are in making an event more sustainable, sporting an event more sustainable. Um, I'm happy to take that one first. It's, uh, for us, we're seeing it's, it's convincing 
those who have worked for, for generations, for decades in sport, who are used to doing things in a certain way, that change can actually be beneficial for them, for, for sponsors, for fans, for the public, to increase participation, to have a positive impact on the environment, to have a positive impact on the local communities. It's convincing them that change is good and that sustainability is good for them and for their business and for the world. So we feel that at this stage, we're still at the early stage of educating people, of convincing them of the value of sustainability in all regards. Um, it crosses, sustainability, you know, is that the concept itself, it's, it's so all-encompassing that at the same time as working on the environmental measures, uh, which definitely the whole infrastructure, transport, waste, that are that, so crucial. We need the engagement of the top scientists, the top engineers working in this space to work closely with the sports movement. Um, there is still a little tendency to work with those companies, with those organisations that have always worked with the organisations. So it's um, it's that looking that there is a competitive environment that to create a differentiation amongst uh, sports that they have to be innovative they have to be creative to search for new solutions that the younger generation are looking for and expect now from from sports given that sports is the world's biggest influencer the biggest platform for educating for for creating change so. Uh, for, for us, it's really convincing them about the, the brand value, about the, that it's viable for them as, a, um, as an organisation and, and it's how to differentiate the sports. Okay, great. Thank you, Ingrid. David? Um, well, if I, yeah, if I, if I look at it more on this occasion then as a, as a service provider in the transport industry, by definition, if you take a, an Olympic Games, for example, that could, could have the requirement to have 1,200 additional coaches or buses on the road just to be able to sustain the games taking place. And that's in addition to any, if we take London as the example, any regular London bus which is providing service for spectators and people that are going about their daily lives in London. You know, almost by definition, the um, extra emissions, for example, created by those buses, kind of, they, they present a an interesting sustainability talking point, but if they're if they're very much required to, to make the event happen, how do we employ you know, tactics and, and ways of, of making sure that we do our absolute best to minimise that impact? And and so at London, for example, the the the, the organising committee had insisted on what's called the Euro Four engine or better. In other words, basically complied with the the low emissions zone. Um, requirements in London uh, and many, many bus and coach companies entered that Euro 4 and, and actually sent vehicles of Euro 5 and, and better engine capacity. So it's about how do, we, how do we repeat that moving forward and make that even better. Again, BMW, the car sponsor, you know, not renowned for, <laughs> for having, you know, you know, efficient vehicles, for example, they're, they, you know, have a bit of a gas guzzler type reputation. But they were the ones who came and said, no, we're going to make these smart diesel vehicles and we're going to provide 100 prototype electric vehicles and BMW until that point didn't produce an electric vehicle. So, you know, in a way, yes, you know, what London did there was really almost take some things by the scruff of the neck and make, by, by working very closely with their partners, make some real effective changes. So again... Um, kind of like setting a standard to work moving forwards with future organising committees to say we can insist on those things, our service providers will comply if we do it the right way and we now have set some great precedent moving forward for major events in, you know, future major events in the UK but also um, moving forward elsewhere in the world. So. Uh, I think uh, as well as 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 trying to kind of emphasise what the questions are, there are some great examples from London about how it was taken forward and made better. 
Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I also think uh, an important aspect is really understanding the legacy needs and the legacy requirements of a host city. So having a clear legacy plan and business case for for a venue to see that and, and, and really right the way through the, the planning and the design and the construction into legacy engagement with the end users so that you leave them with something that will actually be used. It's, it's of a, it, it's, it, it, it is something that is left for them in a way that they feel that they would use it um, and um, it's to really have an idea about what the community needs are and how um, and I think that's a real challenge is when, when a host city is, is appointed is understanding what are the needs of the area and how you can actually use it as a, as a, as a vehicle for regeneration and a vehicle for change and making sure that it's um, that, that engagement follows right the way through the process and on into legacy. Um, and again, I think, David, that was um, an interesting point about the supply chain and really engaging with your supply chain and, and getting them to come forward to you and to provide solutions to environmental impact, social issues, and working with your sponsors. As these are like uh, top companies often that are sponsors and they've got some technologies out there that can help us to deliver more sustainable sporting events. And then um, the third question, third and final question um, within this panel discussion is really how can sporting events provide a lasting benefit to the host city or country? So again, I'll open it to both Ingrid and David, the first one who wants to, to take that question. I'll, I'll jump in again and, uh, and I want to use an example first about how you can make a a lasting effect. I'm going to use the Sydney Games in 2000, the Paralympic Games. It was one of the first games that really put a, a, an education program about the Paralympics and about disabled people and about disabled people's sports. Put it in the school in Australia and brought something like three quarters of a million youngsters to the Paralympic Games to live and breathe that education. Um, at, and so, not just the city of Sydney, but children throughout Australia were given a legacy of being able to come to come to the games, witness you know the highest standard of of sport for people with disabilities in the world, but shake hands, exchange views, chat, laugh with the athletes in the concourses of the stadiums and of the ten the wheelchair tennis stadium or the track and field stadium and I, I witnessed that first hand there. I wasn't competing in Sydney but I was there as an IPC official uh, and saw the, some of the education programs which were going on and as I said the, the kids getting to experience it first hand and those school children are now the young adults and the university graduates of today and, it, and I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that they are their attitudes towards the disabled people in general and disabled sports people and the high performance levels that these people are, are able to reach. I'm sure it's different than it would have been if they hadn't been able to experience A, the program in their school and B, coming to the, the Paralympic Games in Sydney. And I know that in the UK, certainly uh, Deloitte have a wonderful parasport program with Paralympics GB that does a whole bunch of education like that too. Um, uh, and you know, from a Paralympic point of view, to, to build back on, on some of the things I mentioned in the opening remarks about sustaining disability sport and the movement, the IPC and the games, these, these elements um, can not only be left behind, but they can also really be a blueprint, blueprint and a template moving forward for, for future games. And, uh, and what it can leave behind in, in, in the, the entire sort of generations, if you will, not just uh, a, a physical footprint like Olympic Park in London, for example. Thank you, David. Uh, Ingrid? I would fully reiterate what David has just expressed. It's, um, I think we can very much learn from what the Paralympics have done and what Special Olympics, so I'll give another example of a Absolutely. of one of our members, they organise what the 
you know, major events, uh, thousands of athletes, and the uniqueness of the, the Special Olympics is the fact that given that they are specifically for persons with intellectual dis disabilities, the engagement of the families and the influence on the community is in a way even more extensive than any other sports event. The uniqueness of, of them is also, again, we're, we're talking about the social impact, is the fact that as, as part of any Special Olympics, they always have a major summit or conference on the side. So just recently, they had their Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang in South Korea. There they had a major global development summit on the side. And there, that's when they get the, the VIPs, those who have um, influenced politically at the policy level, who recognize and acknowledge the importance of including persons with intellectual disability to then create policy and political change back in their hometowns. Um, just giving another example about the sort of the how do they create sporting events create a lasting benefit on society. We think of um, just recently, we, last year we had the Rugby World Cup in my home country of New Zealand. We just, New Zealand uh, had just suffered a major earthquake in my hometown of Christchurch. The World Cup itself was used as a, as a platform to raise money, to raise awareness internationally about, the, about what, had, what had happened. Um, the athletes were very much engaged and they are a major platform to communicate, to educate. On the in environmental side of things, we've got a long way to go we, because at the moment it's not the, the competitive element amongst the events themselves is not yet such at such a level where we have the companies competing in a way, put, putting the pressure on the events to become more sustainable environmentally. So there's definitely a, a space there and from the sports side of things, we would hope that it is the sponsors themselves who can drive that change. They're the, often the ones with the innovation, with the new methods of doing things, with the new transport solutions. Obviously, transport's a very, it's, it's a fascinating issue, the fact that we have a Google Hangout such as this rather than having a physical meeting. It's the sorts of things that we should be moving towards. The sports movement, those who work for the sports federations travel all the time. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing, the number of flights. Mm event after event. We can take FEI, Equestrian for example, they host over 3,000 events a year. So we've got thousands of events taking place around the world. The number of flights, the impact is, is phenomenal. So it's not necessarily reducing the number of events. It may be changing a little how they are organized. It may be, it's just often considering really the impact that those events events have on the local community. We think of a successful um, sport which is exponentially grown um, is triathlon, the ITU. And one of the reasons for their success is the fact that they, alongside all of their elite competitions, they always have age group competitions. So it means in any host country, any host city, there's always the age group competitors who take part. That's the, that's the communities. It's the families, it's the going from the young folk up to the elderly. So in that way, they have a positive impact on the local community, getting them engaged in the sport, getting them active physically. And also it's a, having a positive impact on the athletes, so having an increased role to pass on messages. Um, and they're also doing a lot with regard to their environmental impact. But there, I mean, there's many, many good examples that I could share, but uh, obviously we're, we're limited in time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David and Ingrid. And I think you both covered the social sides really well. And I do think that of the three questions, this is the most important. It's, and it's the most important aspects of, of any um, city or region um, uh, hosting a major sporting event. And just to talk maybe on the, on, from my background in construction and, and what we've done around, uh, particularly in London, was creating, we had the major contractors working on the London Olympic Park and it really was an opportunity to, um, to develop sustainable construction techniques and what that means for the industry. And again, if we talk about the supply chain, it's um, really engaging with the supply chain to come forward with solutions and technologies that helped us to deliver our key performance indicators around environmental impacts and um, sustainability issues. So what we 
we hope we have left is now an industry of, of global construction companies that um, are more informed um, and more enlightened and more capable of delivering sustainable construction and a greater awareness of, of what that means. Um, and I think you both sp spoke very well around the social aspects of stuff and I think this is really um, helping an industry like the construction industry and how they will move forward in the future and how they will develop and build. Um, so that's the wrap up, that's our three questions asked um, and we heard from Ingrid um, and David today um, speaking very eloquently um, and knowledgeably of, of the industry and what sustainable sport means to them. Um, we started by hearing from Ingrid about how it needs to be integrated, it needs to be an integral part of the members' teams, but, um, and it needs to be considered seriously, but maybe there's um, a lot more room and education needed around the environmental sphere, um, and the social sphere is, is much more advanced. Um, David spoke about lessons learned um, in historically and the evolution of Paralympics and sports, and that um, the London 2012 Games was just an example of 14 hours of, of televised Paralympic sports was was a first and and, and again showcased um, um, Paralympic sports to the world. Um, question two was about what sustainable sport meant and um, the panel talked about how it can have a beneficial change and a positive impact. But really, um, there needs to be uh, business needs to be aware that it can be positive aspect for their business, and it can be a differentiator, and it can help their brand value. Um, and David talked about the transport impacts and how transport impacts from the sporting events are really major, but how we can work with our supply chain and with our sponsors to come forward with with, with solutions and technologies to reduce those impacts. And again, finally, around the legacy, we heard a lot around um, uh, the social um, legacy that, that a sporting event um, results in. And that David mentioned that Sydney was the first game that really addressed Paralympics and really brought it into the fore in the Olympics and Paralympic Games. Um, and Ingrid spoke about engagement of, of at the policy level and the political level to really bring around change and that a sporting event really is a major platform to communicate and educate but again there's a lot more work that needs to be done particularly around the environmental aspects and the travel impacts that also are associated with major sporting events. Um, and I just want one final um, request out to Ingrid and David if they have anything further to, to add before we wrap up this panel discussion today. Well, I guess I'll, I'll close out my piece and, and, and I, I don't want to play up London as I've done already even more, but you know, what we saw in transport terms in London was the first true, particularly from a spectator point of view, the first true public transport Olympic and Paralympic Games. There was no parking at events. You could not drive your car to the front door any one of the Olympic or Paralympic events as a spectator, you had to go on mass transit of some description. Sure, there were some strategic parking rides, but even then, that was from a long way outside of London and you came in uh, via mass transit. So, uh, watershed moment for me in the transport industry to say that uh, it was the first true mass and public transport games. Um, and that, if that doesn't set a standard um, as far as trying to keep those, the, the transport and environmental impact at absolutely as low as possible, then, then I don't know what is. So, uh, again, patting the back to London and, and let's go forward from there. Somewhere like Rio that really uh, does want to, to improve its uh, public transport uh, scenario, then great opportunity because London certainly took it by the scruff of the neck. Thank you. Ingrid, any final words? Final words would reiterate and congratulate, in fact, London, all that was done in relation to sustainability. It's true they have set the standard very high, they've set the bar high, and we hope that it will continue. And for us, the major legacy uh, that has come out is actually the new international standard, ISO 2012 one, because now it's a frame, it gives us a framework to work with and that we can start having some benchmarking, having some baseline uh, on the issue of sustainability. Thank you very much.
Okay. Thank David you. Ingrid, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to say one more thing here. I've been sat in the corner. <laughs> um, my name's Chris, to everyone out there. Chris Argyle Robinson. Um, I'm Martin, the Cat Manager for the Sport of Convention. And I'd just like to thank, um, from Sport of Convention, everyone who's giving up their time to talk about this subject. But also, apologies for the delay to everyone out there in starting. And hopefully, we'll do another one of these on maybe the same subject or a different subject. Yeah, but thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.